So one of the tests in our lab yesterday was a solubility test. Okay? And solubility tells us essentially the degree to which one thing will dissolve in another. Right? That's what solubility is. The degree to which one thing will dissolve in something else. Or if we're using more technical terms, the degree to which a solute will dissolve in a solvent. Okay? Now, most common solvent would be water. In fact, we call it the universal solvent. I don't know why. Not everything dissolves in water, but that's what we call it. Okay? Um, but other things are solvents. Okay? Sometimes we add things to water, which we call solvents, okay? like CLR is a solvent. Mr. Clean is a solvent. Okay? They help water to dissolve things that water either can't dissolve or would take a really long time to dissolve. Okay? These things can assist in that um, you know, dissolving process. Um, but some things, doesn't matter what you put in the water, they won't dissolve. Okay? So you need other things to dissolve them. Like, for example, if you had oil-based paint on your hands. Okay, so you know, stained your deck or your fence or something. Okay, you get that stuff on your hands. No amount of soap and water is going to take that off. It's simply not water soluble. Right? So what do you have to use instead? Just soap probably won't take it off either. Alcohol might um, might take quite a while. Bleach won't take it off. No, bleach will just well, it'll take it off because it'll take your skin off. That's probably not the way you'd like to do it. Okay. A lot of you have never painted, have you? Okay, you get the oil-based paint on your hands, you got to use paint thinner. Okay, it's Varsol and things like that. It's like you know, gasoline even would take it off. Don't use gasoline. It's flammable. Okay, but okay, um, you can use that and it'll dissolve that stuff right away. Okay, oils are soluble in oils, okay, but they're not soluble in water. So, okay, anything that dissolves in something else, okay, we say is soluble. All right, so... We're going to go over some terminology, okay? So some new words, or maybe they're not new to you. Maybe you've heard them before. That'd be good, okay? Understand what's meant by the term polar molecule. We're also going to talk today about why water is different, okay? It seems like every time we come up with a rule, water's the exception to it, okay? Water behaves differently. Water does this. Water does that. We're going to look at the structure of water and why it causes water to do all those strange things, okay? And that's because it is a polar molecule. So this one is really important. There has not been a unit exam in the last eight years where I have not asked a written response question about polar molecules. Okay, so you will need to know what a polar molecule is okay, and what that means. All right. Um, and then lastly, understand that because it is a polar molecule, water has many important and unique properties that make life on Earth possible. Okay, and so we'll look at some of those as well. Questions so far? All right, so some substances will dissolve easily, some don't, okay? We've all had that experience, okay, in our life at some point where we're trying to dissolve something, some things dissolve really fast, some things don't, okay? You probably saw that in the lab yesterday, right? Not that you got all of your sample probably for any of the samples to dissolve like completely, Okay, but you probably saw that some of them dissolved quite a bit faster than others, especially like the red one or the blue one. Okay, those probably started to dissolve and and color the water almost immediately. Okay, so some things are quite a bit more uh, soluble than others. Okay, um, so we'll look at our um, solubility chart here in a minute. Okay, but a substance is said to be insoluble. Okay, insoluble if it will not dissolve in another substance. It's not so much that acid dissolves other stuff as acid like reacts with it. So if I yeah, if I put like zinc, like zinc metal in in hydrochloric acid, for example, the zinc metal will disappear. But it's not because it dissolved, it's because there was a reaction that took place okay, that happened like this. So if I have um, hydrogen chloride and I react it with zinc, okay, after that I get a solution that contains zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. Okay. I don't really. I didn't really dissolve the zinc. If I dissolved the zinc, zinc would still be by itself, right. right? But in this case, a reaction occurred, and I lost. The, there's not the same stuff on the side, on the other side. Yeah. So yeah, we kind of have that. We look at it and we go, oh well, it's gone. It must have dissolved. Well, dissolving, it's still there in its original form. If it's a reaction, it's not there in its original form anymore. Yeah. 
Okay, but that's, that's good. It's good to make that distinction. All right, so if a substance remains insoluble as a solid form or in a solid form, okay, we call it a precipitate. Okay, so this is a, also a new term here is precipitate. Sorry, I wrote across it. Right, precipitate means that we have a solid that is not dissolving. Okay, and essentially we get those sometimes in chemical reactions. Okay, some chemical reactions, I can take two things that are soluble, okay, like solutions, two different solutions, mix them together, and suddenly a solid will form. Right, so when I mix those two things together, the reaction produced something that was insoluble. Right? Because it was insoluble, it couldn't dissolve or stay dissolved, and it falls out of the solution like snow falls out of the sky, okay? and we call that a precipitate. Okay? Because in, in a solution like this, like this is a precipitate that's just formed here in this picture, okay? and it'll start to fall down and collect on the bottom, okay? just like rain or snow precipitates from the sky, falls out of the sky, falls out of solution. Okay? Everybody follow me there? All right, so we'll use that term quite a bit because next week when we start chemical reactions and we're going to do a lab on Thursday okay, of next week on chemical reactions, we'll have some reactions that will produce solids from two otherwise clear solutions being mixed. Okay, so it's kind of funky, okay, but it happens and we get this thing that is insoluble. All right, so remember, insoluble means it will not dissolve. That's another one of those weird English language things, okay? Because inflammable means that it is flammable. Yeah, it's kind of dumb, right? Insoluble means not soluble. Inflammable means it'll catch on fire. Yeah, that's why English is one of the hardest languages to learn. It doesn't make any sense. That's why I don't teach English. I teach things that make sense. Okay, all right. So a solution. So this is just terminology here, guys. So um, you might want to like find a way to highlight or mark these okay, in your notes, even if you got it electronically. Okay, you can highlight in Google Docs. Okay, um, any mixture that contains a solute dissolved in a solvent is a solution. Okay, we also call that a homogeneous mixture. Okay, or homogeneous, however you want to say it. Either way is fine. All right, so this picture here on the left, okay, is showing a homogeneous mixture or a true solution, okay? The solute is completely dissolved. There is only one visible part. That's where this word comes from, okay? Because the prefix homo means one, okay? And so there's only one part to this solution, one visible part, okay? If we're looking at this mixture here, okay, this is a heterogeneous mixture because there is more than one visible part. And that usually indicates that we have a mixture of two things that are not soluble in each other. Okay? We sometimes also call those a mechanical mixture. Okay? So oil and water would be a mechanical mixture. Okay? I can stir it up, but eventually they'll separate again. Okay? That's a mechanical mixture. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if I put um, iron filings in sand, Okay, that would be a mechanical mixture. I could shake it up and disperse the iron filings in the sand all evenly, okay, but could I separate them very quickly? What would be the best way to separate those two things? With a magnet. Yeah, okay, so if I've got a container like a big jar, okay, I would just jam a bar magnet in there and stir it around and I'd pull it out and I'd have no iron filings left in the sand. Okay, they'd all be stuck to the magnet. Well, maybe not all of them, but pretty much all of them, right? I can easily separate them using some physical property, okay? Because they are mechanically mixed, they are not dissolved in one another, okay? If you go to like Subway, they, they ha if you ask for salt and pepper, they only pull out one shaker. You ever notice that? Okay, it's because it's a mechanical mixture of salt and pepper in there, okay? I don't know why. Seems like they should be in separate containers, but that's what they do, okay? It's a mechanical mixture of those two things. All right, um, questions on those two terms. Okay, so solution, okay, and make sure you know homogeneous and heterogeneous, okay, because those are terms that I will use okay, in class. I'll use them in questions on quizzes and tests, so you need to know what they mean. Okay? It's not that I'll have a question that says, what does heterogeneous mean, okay, but I might use it in the context of a question, and if you don't know what it means, how will you answer the question? Okay, kind of a thing. 
All right, solutes. Okay, solutes are the thing that is being dissolved. Most of the time, we would consider that to be a solid material that we are putting into a liquid, but it isn't always the case. Okay, a solute can also be a liquid. Okay, so for example, if I was to pour alcohol into water, that's a liquid into a liquid. The alcohol will be soluble in the water. They will disappear and separate, or sorry, and not separate. Okay, whereas if I pour oil into water, obviously they do separate. Okay, and then the solvent is any substance that will dissolve another substance. Okay, so most of the time it's water, okay? Um, but it could be other things. Like we said, we have like Varsol or paint thinner can dissolve oil-based paint off of your skin without dissolving your skin. All right, questions there on those terms. You were probably already familiar with those ones. All right, now, that is not a puddle of vomit. I'll get to that in a minute. It looks like a puddle of vomit, but it's not, okay? Um, a precipitate, okay, so we talked about this, this term already, but precipitate is a solid produced in a reaction that will not dissolve into solution. Pardon me? Well, except that that wasn't produced in a reaction, right? It was something we tried to, we put it in the water, doesn't dissolve, right? Um, it, this would be, I had two clear solutions. I poured them in and I got a solid as a result of the reaction, That because that will precipitate out, right? Uh, it could also be called a precipitate if I've added so much of something that I have saturated the solution and now no more will dissolve. Then it will start to precipitate the more I add. Okay, like for example, like the way I make Kool-Aid. Okay, I pour, I, you know, I have the water and the Kool-Aid mixture and then I pour in sugar until it won't dissolve anymore. Okay, when I can see that nice thin layer of sugar on the bottom of the, of the pitcher, I know it's good. Okay, because I have a saturated solution of Kool-Aid. Okay, at that point. If you don't make it that way, here's a trick for you. Make it with warm water and then you can get more sugar to dissolve in it, then put it in the fridge, it'll saturate, and you'll get that layer of sugar on the bottom, okay? And then you know it's perfect, okay? Because more stuff will dissolve in warmer water, not often anymore, yeah. You can't, you can't find it anymore. It must have chemicals in it that were like harmful, which is terrible, because I drank it my entire childhood. But, yeah. I don't know why it's so rare anymore, but. How many of you have ever seen like the little packets? Okay, so a few of you, okay? At M and M eats. I gotta go to M and M. Get some more Kool Aid. All right. Uh, so, gonna show you here, guys, uh, what this looks like. Okay, if, when we're getting a precipitate. Okay, I uh, just gotta pause the recording because YouTube doesn't like it if I show somebody else's video in my video. All right. So, some things are soluble. Some things are not. Some things should be, and some should not, okay? The original Hostess Twinkie was cake, okay? It was actually cake, and it was made from things that are natural, like eggs and milk and flour and sugar, okay? That's what gave the Twinkie its distinctive yellow color, was it was made with eggs, okay? And other and milk and other things like that that had kind of natural colors and it, the filling would be made from things like you know butter and sugar it was frosting all right well those twinkies because they're made of natural ingredients didn't have a very long shelf life because natural ingredients spoil quickly that's not good if you're the business who's trying to sell them that means you have to sell them really quickly okay or you lose money because you produce something no one bought and it's spoiled and then just was thrown in the garbage so gradually Okay, and in all kind of food sciences, there's been this movement towards less natural, more artificial ingredients, the addition of preservatives, things like that. And I'm not, guys, I'm not one of those like, I only eat organic food people. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I eat some of the worst food, All right? But just to let you know why a Twinkie, which used to be made out of natural ingredients and was not soluble in water, is now something that is soluble in water. Okay, if you put a Twinkie in water, it will dissolve. Okay, eggs and butter and things like that, they didn't dissolve, okay? But the Twinkie now, okay, is made of other things, right? Uh, in order to give it, what do they put in in order to give it its yellow color? Yeah, yellow dye number five, 
okay? which is actually banned in many countries as a known carcinogen. Okay? It causes cancer. Okay? It's actually banned in many countries. Like the whole European Union, you can't get like yellow dye number five. Okay? Um, so they got this stuff in there because they don't use real eggs anymore. Okay? They use like a protein substitute okay, in there uh, in order to, to, to make the Twinkie. Okay? Uh, they don't use like butter in the frosting anymore. They use other things. And they add in chemicals that will keep it from spoiling on the shelf. Okay? So those things prevent the, the growth of mold and bacteria. Okay? So anything that would prevent the growth of living organisms has to be in some small way toxic. Because okay? that's the only way it would keep living things from growing on them. So um, they add these things, and one of them is one of the ingredients in mortician's fluid. Yeah, that's the stuff they like use to treat dead bodies so that they don't smell before their funeral. Okay, mortician's fluid. Okay, yeah. Um, now, obviously not like they don't like inject a whole bunch of it into the Twinkie. I mean, it's just a very, very small amount. Okay. But th those are the kind of things that are there. Okay. Um, and, and I'm not saying again, that you have to eat all organic food and whatever. It's really expensive to eat all organic food. If you ever notice, like you look at a non-organic pepper and then a organic pepper, and there's like a dollar difference per pepper. Okay. It costs a lot more. Um, but anyway, what they've done is they've gone from, okay, these kind of natural or natural ingredients that would have been in the original Twinkie, okay, to less um, natural ones that are actually more soluble in water than the natural ingredients would have been. Okay. What's that? There's, do that as a lab. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, like the yellow dye number five, they have to add that because without the yellow dye number five, a Twinkie looks like it's made out of drywall paste. Okay, like it looks like it's made out of spackle. Right? It's like this dull gray color, right, without it. Okay, because it doesn't have any eggs in it anymore. I mean, eggs give it the yellow color. Okay, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, this is like the Twinkie been in the glass for about like 10 or 12 minutes. Okay, it's effectively become a Twinkie solution. So if you like broke your jaw and had to eat your meals through a straw, you could dissolve a Twinkie and then just drink it through a straw. It is disgusting. I don't know who would actually do that. We might we should see if someone would do that. Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay, other definition here. So the definition at the bottom, probably pretty important, the definition of solubility, okay? The degree to which a substance will dissolve in another substance. That is, how much solute can go into solution before the solvent becomes saturated, okay? Saturated, also an important term. That is the point where the solution can no longer dissolve any more material. Okay, that saturation point is affected by temperature, agitation, okay, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so every single material has a different degree of solubility. Okay, yesterday we were kind of like, okay, soluble, not soluble. We didn't really have a, a lot of variation in what we said in the lab. Okay, but know that there are quite a bit of, there are, there are many levels to solubility, okay, many different degrees of solubility. Okay, we just didn't kind of go to that length. All right, on your periodic table, I need everyone to take out the periodic table. On the back, you will find a chart that looks pretty much like this one. Okay. I think the only thing that's different is yours says group one ions here, I think. I think that's the only thing that's different. Okay. And then everything else is pretty much the same. So this solubility chart will allow you to determine whether an ionic compound is soluble or not soluble in water. Now, we already said that generally ionic compounds are soluble in water, but there are exceptions. All right? What's that? You have one less column? Which one are you missing? The sulfur one? Okay. Right. So you guys don't have that one. I wonder why they took that off. Did they put the sulfur somewhere else? Hmm. So they changed the data booklet last year. Hmm. Okay. So here's, a, here's how this works. Okay. If I have an ionic compound and I wanted to determine whether it's soluble or not. Okay. So let's say I have... Um, Let's say uh, lithium hydroxide, let's say. 
Okay, so I've got that ionic compound. I've got lithium hydroxide. What I do is I look up the non-metal, okay, or anion first. Okay, so I look up the negatively charged part in this top row, right? So here's hydroxides, the last column on your chart. Anything that's in this first row is going to be soluble. Okay, so if the if those things are with hydroxide, they are soluble in water. Right? Anything down here would likely form a precipitate and be not soluble. Right? So all we have to do is look at what we're dealing with. So our compound is lithium hydroxide. So here's hydroxide, here's lithium. That stuff is soluble. Okay, is that pretty straightforward to use? Okay. Pretty easy, right? So if, if the thing it's paired with is in the first row, soluble. If it's in the second row, not soluble. And you'll see that oftentimes they, they kind of cheap out and they just say most. Okay, If you're down here and it says most, then you got to go up and make sure that what you were looking at isn't in the other row. All right. Questions there. Group one is this first column on the periodic table. Anything that has a plus one charge is considered a group one ion. Right? That's why ammonium is also in there. Okay. Um, let's have you guys try a few here. Okay. So let's just do FES and NaOH first. Too far. All right. Just want to have you write those two down, okay, on, in your notes here somewhere, and determine whether they are soluble or not on your solubility chart. Okay. So let's just look at the second one then. Sodium hydroxide, is that soluble or not? Okay, so we look up hydroxide. Is sodium in that first row? Soluble or not? Soluble. Okay. Then let's have you guys try these ones. Okay. Write them down and then just write S or I beside them. Soluble, insoluble. Okay. And you won't be able to do that one. So you don't have to do number six because you guys don't have that column with the S in it. So our first one, we got lithium fluoride. Okay, so we go up, we find fluoride is right here. Okay, and it says it's soluble with most things, but lithium is the first thing listed in the slightly soluble slash insoluble row. All right, so that one would be insoluble. Um, for number two, we have sodium sulfate. Okay, so we find sulfate. It says it's soluble with most things. That's sort of helpful. I still have to check and make sure sodium isn't down here in the second row, which it's not. So sodium sulfate would be soluble. Okay. Um, and then we have ammonium nitrate. Okay. So we go back up here. Ammonium is going to be in with the group one ions. Basically everything with ammonium is soluble. Okay. So it's soluble with most things except for these incredibly rare ions. Okay. Um, all right. And then we have silver chloride. So if we go up here and find chlorine, chlorine's with bromine and iodine, soluble with most things, but not with silver. Silver's in the second row. Okay, then we have lead two, sorry, lead four, no, lead two, lead two iodide. Okay, uh, so iodine's right here, soluble with most things, but I see that PB2 plus is here, okay, in the second row, so that one would be insoluble, but it might be soluble with lead four plus. Okay, that's the weird thing, okay? Some of those uh, multivalent metals that have more than one possible charge are soluble in one form and not soluble in the other. Okay, uh, then we have potassium phosphate. So we find phosphate, okay, it's right here. Okay, it is soluble with potassium, so that one is good. Right? And then we got uh, mercury chloride. Okay, so chlorine would be here. Okay, soluble with most things, but not with mercury two plus. Okay, everybody all right with how that works? Okay, this is what you're gonna be expected to do with this stuff, okay? Um, I may just give you like a multiple choice question and ask which of the following are soluble and you'd have to, you know, use your solubility chart to figure out which of the compounds would be soluble, just like you did here, okay? Or as we get into reactions and actually in our reactions lab, I might give you something like this where I say, um,
lead two nitrates plus um, potassium iodide. Okay, and then once we've done reactions, I'll say predict the products and uh, indicate which ones are soluble. Okay, so once you once we get to this point, you would say, all right, well my react my products will be potassium nitrate and lead two iodide, and then you'd have to look up on your solubility chart if they're soluble or not. This one is, that one's not. Okay, in fact, that's bright yellow. Okay. You take two clear solutions, and when you mix them together, you get a bright yellow precipitate. Okay. All right, questions on how that works? Okay, so that'll be the expectation for you to be able to use the solubility chart. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break here because I've been talking pretty much nonstop since the start. So I'll give you three minutes, okay? You can get up, talk to your friend, check your phone, whatever. Okay, three minutes, then I'm going to talk about polar molecules. Okay, so we're going to talk now about polar molecules, water's a polar molecule, what that means in terms of the behavior of the molecule, why water does weird things, okay? So atoms of different elements can form compounds, and electrons can be gained or lost if it's ionic. But if it's a molecular compound, they have to share the electrons. Now that makes it sound like that sharing is all hunky-dory and everybody gets everything 50-50, except this isn't really good sharing, okay? This is like sharing, I get it nine out of 10 times, sharing, okay? Not a deal you would likely make, okay? Because it's not a good deal, it's not really true sharing, okay? That's why this is called a polar covalent bond because the electrons are not shared equally, Okay, they are shared um, unequally. And the reason for that is something called electronegativity, right? If you look at your periodic table, it's actually one of the numbers listed in each element, okay? So if you look at the key here, the key is for iron. Um, the electronegativity number is the small number just above the atom's symbol, okay? So for hydrogen, that number is 2.2, right? For uh, oxygen, that number is 3.4. So oxygen is far more electronegative than is hydrogen. And that means that it holds on to electrons more tightly than hydrogen does. So the bigger the electronegativity, the more tightly that atom holds on to electrons. Everybody kind of follow me on that one? So as a result of that, this shared electron and this shared electron don't orbit all the way around uh, hydrogen like a perfect circle, okay? Their orbit would probably look more like this. All right, meaning they are spending far more time around oxygen than they are around hydrogen. So as a result, it's like you have these two hydrogen atoms, which in their nucleus, there's how many protons in the nucleus of a hydrogen atom? One. So it's like you got this bare proton and this bare proton sticking up from the top of this molecule. Okay? And protons are really positive. Meanwhile, down here with the oxygen, it's got its nucleus, but it's got all these electrons around the outside of it. Okay? So what we end up having is a positive pole, a positive pole, and then like two negative poles at the bottom. Right? Hence polar molecule. One end of the molecule has a charge that's positive and the other end has a charge that's negative, just like the Earth has a north and a south pole. Everybody follow me on that? Now, because this is charged, okay, or sort of charged, then it can attract other polar molecules to itself, right? Because another water molecule, okay, would be attracted to this positive part with its negative part. Okay, so what they do is they attract towards each other and they form a hydrogen bond. All right, it's almost like an, kind of an ionic thing, but it's, it's a hydrogen bond where they come together and they join, and those hydrogen bonds are not very strong. Okay, they're quite weak, in fact, but they break and reform very easily because they're always based on the same thing. Ooh, you're my opposite. Oh. And they want to they want to get close because they're opposite. So they're attracted. They'll they'll hold there for a while, but any basically anything can make them break apart. Okay, but then they forget that they broke apart and they ooh look and then they're back together again. Okay, uh, so these these 
hydrogen bonds break and reform, break and reform very, very easily. Okay? But essentially what it means is water molecules can bond to other water molecules. And that's what makes water do weird things, okay? like surface tension. You ever notice you can fill a glass more than half full? Okay. Sorry, more than half full. More than full full. Of course you can fill a glass more than half full. More than full. Okay. It'll make that little meniscus on the top, that kind of thin, it almost looks like a film, but it's not. Okay. It's what that is, okay, is that it is just the the water molecules forming hydrogen bonds with each other and essentially being able to hold that shape, even though it's higher than the top of the glass, right? You'll see that too, like um, after it rains, okay? sometimes on, like if someone has just waxed their car, if you look at some cars out in the parking lot, you'll see like big beads of water just sitting on the on the top and on the hood, okay? And that's because uh, if that car is waxed, the the water doesn't penetrate, doesn't, it, um, it's a way to protect the paint actually. So it, it just sits there and it forms these, always these beads because that's surface tension. Water is polar, it bonds with itself and it forms these shapes, all right? So that's one of those kind of weird things that water does because it's a polar molecule. We'll talk about a few more here, all right? So the big thing about polar molecules is that they are gonna share the electrons, but that sharing isn't equal. That's just terrible. I didn't write that well at all. Molecules, okay? The sharing is not always equal, okay? Some are more electronegative, okay? So if the electrons, okay, are unequally shared, okay, they're distributed non-symmetrically, then we call that a polar covalent bond. And these are the hydrogen bonds I was telling you about before in my crudely drawn diagram. Okay, this is far better. So the positive hydrogen of one molecule is gonna form a hydrogen bond with the negative end of an oxygen atom on another water molecule. Okay, that is hydrogen bond. Okay, that's also what keeps like a water droplet on the side of a cold glass. All right, and if you have like a really, like a, a glass and it's full of really cold water, you got lots of ice in it, you'll notice that water starts to condense on the side of the glass, okay? But the water droplets have to get to a certain size before they'll run down the side, okay? Because they can actually stick through this hydrogen bonding process to the glass, okay? They can form a hydrogen bond with the glass and stick to it until they get too big for those hydrogen bonds to support the mass and then they just fall, all right? But it's the same idea. Okay, so we got these hydrogen bonds that are going on. We have these molecules that have positive and negative charges, right? But you can kind of see in that diagram there on the right that there's almost like a fixed distance that the water molecules will stay away from each other. Everybody kind of with me there? Okay, and that's because if you start getting them too close together, you're going to start getting protons too close together. Okay, like the nuclei are going to start getting too close. And when that happens, there's going to be a repulsion back to this kind of further distance again. Right? And that's why water does what when it freezes? It expands. Okay? Most things contract when they become a solid. Okay? Water doesn't because water actually takes up the least amount of space at about 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? That's where water would have the least volume, about 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? So it's got more volume if it's like 20. Okay? You start cooling it, it will contract, as all materials do, slight amount. Okay? But then after 4 degrees, you're now starting to get the molecules too close together. And they'll repel, and they'll form a crystalline shape known as ice. Okay, Now, think about this. So you've got ice, where the water molecules tried to get closer together, but then were repelled slightly and then froze this distance apart. Which means ice is what compared to water? Not only larger, but less dense. Okay, because water that's colder, that's a liquid, or sorry, not colder, so water that's a liquid, okay, is actually going to be more dense because the molecules will be closer together, which is why ice floats. Okay, that is not the case for most materials. Most materials, when they're a solid, are more dense than their liquid counterpart, and so they would sink. Okay, if you were to put like, if you were to freeze some other material and put it in its liquid counterpart, it would sink to the bottom because it would be more dense. But ice floats, and that's pretty important. 
think about in the winter time around here, right? You got fish that are in all the lakes and stuff. If ice was more dense than water, would fish survive the winter? They wouldn't because their lakes would freeze from the bottom. Okay? And these fish would always be exposed to the, the cold temperature on the top and the, the lakes would freeze all the way. Okay? They'd start at the bottom and they'd freeze all the way to the top. Right? But because ice is less dense, it freezes, it freezes, forms on the top, and then insulates the water underneath. Okay? And so the, the lakes, unless it gets really cold, won't freeze all the way to the bottom. Okay? That sort of makes sense. It's like another one of those weird things that water does that most things don't, but we just take for granted. When you put ice in a drink, it just stays on the top, which may be inconvenient when you're trying to drink, it hits you in the face. But okay? yeah. maybe if it sank, it would be easier. I don't know. All right, so that's part of polar molecules. Okay, so the water molecule is shaped kind of like a right angle, right? There, there's that repulsion. Okay, these these two hydrogen atoms are their their nuclei are both positive. They don't want to get too close together. Okay, so they create some distance between themselves, right? And they essentially form this orientation. So one water molecule can form hydrogen bonds with four other polar molecules, usually other water molecules. So this is what I was telling you about before here with uh, the density of water and ice, okay? So in the ice cube here, okay, we see that it's a crystalline shape, okay, or a crystalline solid because that's what ice is, okay? And that's because the water molecules have repelled each other and made space between them, okay, making it less dense than liquid water, okay? In liquid water, the molecules are actually a little bit closer together, okay, or quite a bit closer together, and as a result, okay, it's more dense than ice is. Okay. And as we said, water can't just, it won't just bond with itself, I mean, it, obviously it can, but it can also bond with other polar molecules, like ammonia, which has a positive end and a negative end. All right, so we definitely need to know what hydrogen bonds are, okay, and we definitely need to know what polar molecules are. Whenever I ask a question on an exam okay, about polar molecules, what I'm looking for is a description of what a polar molecule is. So it's a molecule where the electrons are not shared equally, okay, and there's a positive and negative end. And then something about you know hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen atoms of one water molecule can bond to the negative part of another uh, polar molecule, et cetera. So explaining what hydrogen bonds are, okay, that they're weak, they can reform, break, okay, stuff like that. I'm looking for all of those details when you're explaining to me what a polar molecule and its implications are. Okay, so it's hydrogen bonding that essentially makes a lot of this stuff happen. Now, a plant, okay, let's say if we're talking about like a really tall tree, okay, it's so like a giant sequoia tree or something like that. It's got to transport water from its roots all the way to the leaves at the very top, which could be over 100 meters. Okay, how does it do that? Well, osmosis provides the pulling force, yes, but what keeps the water from falling back down? Yes, and the capillary effect is caused by hydrogen bonds. Okay, it's the fact that water is polar that makes it possible for a plant to transport water using no energy at all. Okay, a plant expends no energy to transport water from its roots to its leaves. Okay, there's no pump inside the plant. There's no heart that's going and pumping the water from the roots to the top. Okay, it's all accomplished by Osmosis, which is water evaporates from the leaves and leaves the salt behind, okay? And then water tries to balance that salt. It's pulled upwards by that imbalance and it's kept from falling back down by the capillary effect of having the hydrogen bonds stick the water together and to the inside of the tree, okay? So water can form hydrogen bonds with the inside of the tubes called the xylem and it can form hydrogen bonds with itself, all right? How many of you have ever seen uh, the toy, like barrel of monkeys? Ever seen that toy, right? The monkeys with the hooked hands, okay? It's like that, okay? That's what water would look like inside the trunk of a tree. Every water molecule hooked to another, okay? Or hooked to the side of the, of the tree, okay? That all prevents it from falling back down. Now, those bonds will break, but they reform very quickly, right? So water is not going to have any trouble okay, getting or staying kind of where it is. The key to this, though, is that 
those tubes have to be small. They have to be microscopic, in fact. All right. Um, if they were like a straw, a tree wouldn't be able to do this. Okay. You ever notice that if you have a little straw, it's really easy to suck fluid through the little straw, but the bigger the straw gets, it's actually harder. Right? The straw wants to collapse. Okay. But not only that, you're supporting a bigger column of water. So the bigger the tube gets, the more water is in the tube, and thus the heavier it is. Okay? The hydrogen bonds aren't strong enough to support a column of water like this, okay? but they are strong enough to support a microscopically small column of water. So on the inside of a tree, even though you know we look at the inside of a tree and think wood is you know solid, it's actually made up of like millions of microscopic tubes. Okay, each one of those tubes carrying a column of water that is very small that can be supported by hydrogen bonding. All right, so if we looked inside the tubes of a tree, okay, this is what we would see: water molecules. Okay, so. This is what we're looking at right here. Okay, water molecules in there. Okay, they're hydrogen bonded to each other. Okay, right here, and they are hydrogen bonded to the inside of the tree. That's two different processes, though. Okay, hydrogen bonding can be referred to as cohesion or adhesion. Okay, and these are these are terms we need to know. Okay, cohesion. Okay, it's hydrogen bonding from one water molecule to another. Okay, so it's the same molecule. That's cohesion. Okay. Adhesion is a water molecule is hydrogen bonded to something other than water. Okay. It's adhering to something else. Okay. And adhesive is designed to put two things together. Right? That's where that adhesion comes from. Okay. And we'll actually look at this again when we get to the biology unit. We start talking about transport of water in plants. We'll look at this process again, but in from a different perspective. Okay. So cohesion is one example of what happens when hydrogen bonding occurs. Okay. And the other one is adhesion. Okay. So adhesion is the clinging of a substance to another. Okay. And that is also caused by hydrogen bonds. So when we were saying, you know, you had the beaded water on the hood of a, of a car. Okay. You also see it on a leaf. Because okay, a leaf is covered by a waxy cuticle. So when it rains, okay, the water beads onto the leaves and then runs off. Right? Plants actually can't absorb water through their leaves. Right? But they're covered with this, with this waxy layer to prevent water from evaporating out of them. But it's also convenient because the water droplets will bead on there and run off and then they'll fall into the soil right where their roots are. Okay? So it's, it's a pretty good strategy. As the leaf gets loaded with water, it tilts. And it all runs off right to where the roots are going to be. Okay? Plants have evolved okay, to do that kind of stuff. All right, so um, cohesion and adhesion also produce the surface tension we talked about. Um, I saw this picture. I thought it was cool, and I spent like an hour and a half trying it. That's an hour and a half of my life I won't get back. I was never successful with it. Apparently, you have to make sure that the pointy ends are bent upwards. I never thought of that. Use another paper clip. Okay, I kept trying to put it down. Of course, my finger kept breaking the surface tension on the water, and it just I had a glass full of paper clips, but <laughs> I was done. Okay. Um, yeah, so it didn't work for me, but I never thought of that. Lower it with something else. Yeah. Okay. But then wouldn't the other paper clip also break the surface tension? It's light enough, it doesn't. Right? Try, nah, maybe I have to find another hour and a half of my life just spent on that. All right, um, so is that making sense? Okay, so we need to know, we need to be able to explain what a polar molecule is, that unequal sharing, okay? We gotta be able to talk about hydrogen bonding, talk about some effects of that, talk about cohesion and adhesion, possibly a five mark question if we talk about all of those things, okay? Now, there are some animals that take advantage of this, not just plants, but some animals as well, okay? You've ever seen the Jesus lizard? Okay, I don't remember what its actual name is, but that's what everyone calls it. Okay, because it can run across the water. Now, it has these, you know, big kind of splayed feet, right? And as it runs across the water, okay, it actually kind of sits on the surface tension. It doesn't really break the surface tension so much and it's able to run across. Okay, same with um, all kinds of bugs that can sit on top of the water. 
right? They don't break the surface tension of the water, okay? They sit on that surface tension on those hydrogen bonds like the water strider does, okay, or mayflies do, okay, and things like that, any kind of, you know, bug that can land on the water. Now, if I've got a water strider like that that's sitting on the water, okay, it's fine there until I throw a rock in the water. Then what? Then it'll, yeah, it'll sink. Because what did I do to the surface tension? I broke it, okay? That's why you don't see like a lot of stuff floating on really rapidly moving water, like over rapids and things like that. You tend to see things floating on water that's flowing slowly or is still, right? Because the surface tension is able to be maintained, okay? It's not being broken by the fact water's going over rocks and things like that. It was the surface tension. Okay, I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> okay, but I mean, you kind of have a similar thing too if you have like oil sitting on top of water and you take like a drop of soap, right? Put it in there and the oil will just right to the sides. Okay, it's similar. It's not exactly the same thing, but similar to that. Okay, it affects the tension, okay, that the oil essentially was floating on. Okay. All right, questions on that stuff there? That's the end for today. So you have about 10, 13 minutes, something like that. Okay, to, um, you can work with your group. Okay, start looking at your analysis for your lab. Maybe work on your lab a little bit on your phone. I don't have the Chromebooks, they were booked already. Okay, um, but you guys can work on that a little bit for the remainder of class. Can we go into the library? No. Nope. Oh, for scheduled help, yeah. yeah. But you, you have to use the ones in there. You can't take mine there. Yeah, yeah. Um, we try not to have too many people go in there. I mean, there's Chromebooks in here, so if you need to use a computer, come in here. There'll be room in here.